Thank you, Dr. Ayalet. Um, I now open the floor for questions. If you have any questions, please write it in the chat box. Um, but before I start reading out some, uh, Keshi Siyan, sir, do you have any questions, sir? Keshi Siyan, sir? Thank you very much for a very comprehensive presentation. And war is a dirty business. Uh, as you were delivering your presentation, I was thinking of uh, Pope uh, Paul VI, who in 1967 spoke at the United Nations in New York. And uh, he had a very interesting sentence, which still rings in my ear after all these years. He said, man should put an end to war or war will put an end to men. After listening to you, uh, I should amend that saying and said, men and women should put an end to war. Otherwise, war is going to put an end to men and women. Thanks. Thank you for this comment. And in, in that sense, I think that uh, our critical reading of the experiences of soldiers I think it's very, very careful not to present uh, militarized pictures of what's going on and to actually bring the truth in the face of societies, leaders, scholars, students of war and the military. It is a difficult task to be a soldier. It is a very difficult task to be a combatant and war is indeed a dirty business. Deepa, you are uh, muted. I'm sorry. Um, so uh, Arushi has asked, um, could you please talk about the change in socioeconomic status of women in combatant roles? Okay, thank you so much for this question. So indeed, um, first of all, in the context of Israel, we need to remember that uh, almost everyone goes to the military. I mean, it's something that all societies are going through and, and, uh, and opposed to other societies in which uh, joining the military is a choice in Israel, it's not, it's, in Israel, it's not a choice. So uh, uh, in that sense, uh, we were hoping to see some upgrading in the status, yes, in, in the status in civil life after the military service in, uh, of women that serve in combat roles when we know now that it's still not the case. It is still not the case. And I also can relate to the fact that, um, for instance, if you, if you know, if you can see if you're following Israeli politics, so everybody uh, is always waiting for the chief of staff, the, gen the general, when he uh, leaves his, uh, his uh, position in the military, they're waiting him to join politics. And they're looking, okay, so which party he's gonna go and join into Eisenkot was released recently and everybody was waiting for Eisenkot, uh, the, the previous chief of staff, which party is gonna join if he decided uh, not to go into politics. We see other generals that didn't, uh, was so successful in politics. And in women, with women, I have to say, this is not really the case. I mean, uh, we still cannot see, uh, uh, what's happening to women in terms of uh, socioeconomic status. But I can tell you another thing. I think that this whole uh, experience of being a combatant, I think that women that conclude this kind of service are in a way, most of them at least, more secure in their position in society. And now when they're going to go in their civic life in, in some sort of job, where, wherever they're going to be, and some, uh, they will hear some comments, sexist com uh, comments or sexual harassment. So they, will, they know their place. Excuse me, can you stop this nonsense and we can move on? And this was something that was repeatedly, repeatedly, a presence in the narratives in terms of they know their place. You will not uh, cause me to shut up. I will say what I have to say. So it's not about uh, promoting them or advancing them in terms of socioeconomic status, but it's something internal that uh, uh, most of them have now that they are secure in their position in society of, of really being uh, 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 
recognizing their abilities. And it's really, really important, I think. Uh, so we have another question which says, do you think there's a direct correlation between lack of women in political leadership and their composition in the IDF? Um, well, I don't know. I think it's the other way around because usually, as I said before, uh, usually uh, the public, because the military is very, very central in Israel, Many times we're waiting for the general to conclude the roles and join politics and not the other way around. Now, I have to say that recently, at least in these elections, we have our fourth elections in two years, and we can talk about a different talk about Israeli politics and you know, instability and so on. But uh, seriously, I think that the, the civil uh, um, elements and uh, uh, civil priorities are the economic priorities, coping with coronavirus and all that, it's like, it's more important at the moment. So I can see that the, the, leading, the leading now, the leading politicians are not necessarily those who were, uh, you know, build up in the military and move on, uh, uh, but, you know, uh, civil politicians uh, from other uh, spheres in life. Uh, Ma'am, Ankita is asking, do men and women combatants share the same privi uh, privileges once they retire? Okay, so uh, in a sense, I have to say that at first, yes, because everyone that is uh, entitled to this role, they have the specific card, they have a specific rights. So everybody that are released from the military and the work combatants, they have specific rights in uh, gaining education, higher education, uh, and specific monetary assistance. But I have to say that much more men are reaching higher levels and higher ranks in the military. Therefore, their salary is much higher and their, uh, and their uh, starting point in the civic life afterwards in a much higher status. But all the combatants uh, in, in the same level, in the lower ranks, are in the same uh, status uh, when they released in, from the army. Yeah. So a, a very similar question has also been asked by Anuradha. The existing uh, infrastructure, infrastructure already allows women to serve leadership roles above battalion level. But with this combat restriction being lifted, where will lower ranks fall into when the promotion race is already a competitive field? Well, I think that um, we need to understand now there is another element in the military that the, um, I think that some of the prestigious roles are combat roles and elite units, but some of the prestigious roles are considered the special units in the intelligence. The special units in the intelligence that uh, um, could be considered as those that in civic life, you can go straight to high tech companies and they will just take you into, uh, I don't know, prestigious role and then we have wonderful salary. So we don't have only the combat roles. We have also the intelligence that is very, very, very uh, prestigious now. And I think that in the all other roles, administrative roles will still have men and women that are conducting these roles. And um, I think women are still the majority of those who are conducting all the administrative roles. And men are, as I said, the majority in combat roles, but there's, there's a slight uh, trend in the statistics. So uh, the next question uh, is, in order to cope up with the discriminatory behavior of leadership and peers, do combat women attempt to show greater brutality? Um, I think that this is a wonderful question, and what we um, what we heard from them uh, did not include greater brutality, but they did indeed try to prove themselves worthy all the time. They felt that they had to be better than the boys, better than the guys, in order to be okay. So they always fight together to run faster, to shoot better, to do everything in the exercises, everything much, much better in order to consider uh, uh, themselves worthy and to justify their position there. And I have to say that they were uh, very much frustrated 
when the uh, possibility was not given to them because even though when they are considered as combatants, when there is operational activity, in, informally, they take them in. They take them in. So, you know, they have to, put, no, 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 I'm also, you know, soldiers, they want to see action. They want to participate. They want to prove their abilities, whatever this action might be. And it's really, really uh, uh, important, but so they have to struggle that even if they are within the same unit, they have to struggle to go to active duty. And this is very, very interesting. They have to to, 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 to fight for this. To, to, okay. Uh, yeah. Nina, uh, can I ask you to? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I would like to ask whether the Israeli army is promoting some programs to better integrate women in uh, combat roles. Thank you. I, I didn't hear the sound somehow is, uh, can you repeat this question louder? Yes, I would like to ask whether the Israeli army is promoting some programs to better integrate women in combat roles. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Nina. So um, I think that, first of all, I think the, the issue of the amount of women is very, very important. Because in general, in Israel, there's the larger amount of women in the military uh, in, in any other state. There's no any other state that have one third of the military personnel that are women. So soldier in general, soldiers in general are used to seeing women in, in, you know, in, in their environment. Now, when women are going into combat roles, at first it was very, very difficult because there was just a few. Now we're talking about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. So I think that the commanders are starting to grasp the idea that women are there and should be treated equally and respectfully. But as I said at the beginning of the talk, you know, this whole issue of the award ceremony that was, you know, uh, after one of Israel's operations. So the, I think that the general was thinking, okay, we need to include women in this prize because, you know, uh, uh, we need to think about equality and so on and so forth. So they included women, but the justification for the award that they, they did not panic. Seriously? Is this the justification that you could find? You know, I have narratives of 100 women that did in extraordinary things and, and actions and, and everything. And this is the best that you could do. So obviously the generals are, you know, need to go through a process in order to do that. And also in terms of military gear, there are all sorts of, of um, thinking about this issue. They have specific vests that, you know, they insert slowly, slowly and gradually. And I can give you an example, like I have an interview with some combatant and she was describing a status that she was sitting in an ambush. And she was, it was in the, the border with Egypt, and it was against those infiltrators that come from Africa. It wasn't like a military thing, but she was sitting there and trying to, uh, 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 to see if they're going to cross or not going to cross. And she said, I'm sitting there. I'm in an operational activity. And all that I can think of that I, would, I shouldn't, sorry for using this word, that I shouldn't pee right now because my snowsuit is not suitable for me. I can't do it right here. I'm with the men soldiers next to me. And I can't operate this. So now I heard that they're inserting specific snowsuits. They're inserting specific, you know, uniforms. But it's really, really slow. It's slow because women are already there and they need this equipment in order to do the role, uh, you know, to the best that they can. Uh, Kumar Samisa, can I ask you to put <clears throat> yeah. up the question, please? Um, thanks, thanks, Deepa. It's, it's really delightful to hear you, Ayelet. How many times one can hear, it's really delightful. Um, you know, there was a reference that the book has been translated into Hebrew or being done. My question is, will the Hebrew translation be the exact literal, literal translation of the original work? Or are you modifying something? Which basically means, are you changing anything in your overall approach? If that is the case, what are the changes which one can see in Hebrew, not in English? Thank you so much for this question. And uh, again, thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, 
we made a lot of effort to translate the book to Hebrew. It is not identical to the English version. It is a revised version. And the revision is mainly because the English version of the book is intended mainly to scholars of international relations and security studies and feminist international relations and so on. And the Hebrew version is also to scholars of the field of the military and, and gender and uh, soci sociology, trauma, political science, but also to the public. And another thing that was very, very important to us, you know, Israel, it's a small state and we are, everybody knows everyone. It's a, not everybody, but it's like, this is the sense. And in the difficult parts, some of the difficult parts that I was, uh, I can talk about the explosion that was happening in this front or another front and this year and that year, Israeli, they know who died there. They know exactly what happened there. Someone injured, if it's a civilian, if it's a soldier, we know the names, we know, we count them. And it's, it's an issue. So we had to, not to change the stories that make it, uh, brighter, but just to make the anim anonymized, truly anonymized, that no one or no parents that lost their, their kids that they will feel, you know, uncomfortable uh, in that sense. Uh, other modifications also because in Hebrew, I don't need to explain all that much about the military because others, it, it's like, it sounds so weird. We're like, seriously, we are a really, really weird society. The military is so central, but for Israelis and for Hebrew readers, it's it's clear, it's obvious. You know, when a, 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 you have a mother in, in you know in an ultrasound, you have a baby in her you know in her belly. She goes to the intersect, ultrasound. They they say you have a boy. The the first thing that comes to your mind, okay, so which military units is going to go to? So, in that sense, you know, Hebrew readers. They, they feel things that I don't need to mention. And, uh, you know, in the English version, it's totally different because it's not neutral, you know, neutral or whatsoever in that sense. Uh, can I ask Mudasit to put across this question, please? Uh, thank you. It was uh, very nice to hear from you. I just wanted to know, are there any other studies on kind of, you know, I mean, there are very few countries where actually women serve in, in combatant roles, but uh, wherever they do, are there any studies on the similar kind of approaches, the experiences they face? And uh, I mean, if there are any studies, is there, I mean, what are the experiences? Is this very similar or, you know, are there differences? Just to get you in, just to get yes. in. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for this question. I think that, um, the case that was, uh, you know, the most famous case is the U.S. military. And there are many, many combat women in the U.S. military. And they are, all combat roles are open to women. All combat roles are open to women, also in the Canadian force, also at the Australian force. Uh, so all the roles are open to women, but it is not a mandatory service. So we have uh, also a very, very limited amount of women going into these roles. And also in the US military, specific uh, statuses from societies are joining the militaries. Often in the US military, uh, people from lower status are joining the military into to gain rights afterwards and higher education and so on and so forth. So we have different population here. And I think that, and I'm now involved in a comparative uh, study of uh, US uh, veterans and Israeli veterans. And what is, is striking is that in the US military, sexual, not just sexual harassment, because sexual harassments are everywhere. It's a militarized society, it's a militarized uh, uh, organization. So there are some comments, okay, verbal comments. You have it everywhere, every day in Israel, in America, and so on. But in the, US, uh, in the US military, there are many, many, many sexual assaults, like physical sexual assaults that the, the narratives of the uh, US military veterans, the women there was the, the main 
thing to be fear like to to to, to be to do, to be afraid of is sexual assaults and not the enemy so that was striking and in the Israeli military also because the the First of all, they recruit everyone. It's the entire society. And also the deployment in America, it was for nine months and then you go home after nine months. It's really disorientation. And in Israel, you go for three weeks and then you go back to a weekend to your family, to your friends. You have your, you know, your ideas are organized differently. So I think this is one of the elements here um, that I tackled with, but I, I admit that I didn't do... Uh, a large scale comparative research, but it's, um, it's a different experience. And another thing that I can say is the fact that in Israel, the enemies or what is considered to be enemies is really near the borders. And the borders are like three hours from everywhere. It's like, it's such a tiny place. So you just need to go, it's like five hours from north to south and, and, and two and a half hours from west to, to east. You know, you can't, so when you, when you think about protecting the country, so you really feel, you know, the soldiers, they feel that they're protecting the country, whatever the cause would be, and the politics, if they agree or not agree, but they feel that they're protecting the country. And in other societies, mainly, they just need to go abroad and they fly away many, many hours to protect, I don't know, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan. So it's like different, different fronts that's very, very far away from home. So the idea of protection is different. I hope um, I Ruti, can I ask you to uh, place your question, please? Thank you, Deepa. Thank you, Professor. I think that's a very engaging conversation. I mean, this is something that we hear very often about how, you know, the Israeli Defense Forces are trying to integrate um, the LGBTQ, all your non-heterosexual uh, genders also into the armed forces. So I'm just trying to extend the argument and seeing what sort of an impact has breaking these binaries had on integrating even non-heterosexual genders. Um, I think that this, this is a very, very interesting uh, question. I think that um, what we heard from the soldiers, uh, some of them were lesbians, uh, some of them were not. Uh, they felt very good. They felt very good with their identity. They said that the, the military assisted them to, you know, to accept themselves uh, uh, better. And even I think that um, one of the main issues uh, that was brought to us, we asked them, what was the most meaningful experience that you had in the military? And then we let them answer. You know, everybody answered. One answered about an explosion. One answered about the friend died. One answer about, uh, you know, this front, that front, and so on. And we have a few soldiers that were talking about that, you know, one of them told us, I was in the Gaza front. It was in the middle of operation. And I had a friend of mine, uh, uh, a peer, that was very, very uh, distressed. And he was... Um, he was saying that he was, I think he's gay and he think he wants to change his gender. And he was, and she was like, and she, she said to us, that was the most meaningful experience that I have, how the military took him, assisted him uh, uh, to move to uh, a different unit and to assist him and escort him in this process of becoming a transgender and moving to a different gender and allowing them to be what he wants to be. And now he is a woman uh, studying abroad. This is what she said. So that was the most you know, meaningful experience for her from the military service to see how the IDF treated her friend. So I think in that sense, I'm sure, I'm sure that there are cases of discrimination, not question whatsoever as in any place elsewhere, but not something specifically. I think that um, if at all, in, in, in that sense, the, the, the women in combat, they felt quite uh, comfortable with their position. Um, so we have another question from Sumana. Um, chauvinistic, chauvinist attitude and misogyny is not limited to men only. Did you come across during your interviews any such in... Uh, any, uh, did you come across your interviews any such inclination among women in combat roles? And in your opinion, how does such change in outlook impacts 
socialist understanding of gender. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was a very, very serious question, actually, two questions, so I'll try to be brief. I see that our time is running off, but so this is a wonderful question. I think that um, one thing I can say in terms of being a woman or being a chauvinistic or, or taking a different stance, what is very interesting was the perception of the combat women as opposed to other women, non-combat women. We heard stories, I was a combat woman. I know how to shoot well. I know how to do this. And they didn't do this training. So they don't know how to shoot and da, 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 da. So we did hear not chauvinistic, you know, but, but like, let's say it gently, they have this uh, sense that they're better. Okay, that the combat, they felt they're better than the non-combat women that was there and they had to protect them. So in that sense, this is the kind of issues that we sense. We didn't uh, see any chauvinistic attitudes other than that. Regarding the appearance, right? That was the second uh, answer of being masculine, being feminine. I have to tell you that the narratives of the soldiers that we interviewed indicated that some of them, they felt strong and being strong and muscly is very, very important when you are in duty, on duty, when you're in your military system, uh, you know, service. But when they go home for the weekend, they felt uncomfortable with all these muscles. So some of them just said, I had to put a lot of makeup and I, I had to hide my shoulders because my shoulders are, are manly. So they had to struggle on the one hand, I'm strong. I'm proud that I'm strong and I can do all the things that I do. But when I come home for, for a weekend, I feel uncomfortable because I'm supposed to look in a different shape. So this is one thing that I have. And also another thing that I can say in terms of masculine and feminine, there were many, many descriptions about the relations towards the weapon. They felt very connected to their weapon they felt that the weapon is a part of their body. They felt proud, like, ooh, look at this. You know, she has a very long gun. Like, you know, it's like, it's really, they were so, so excited about this whole thing, about being in this uh, position and carrying the gun and, you know, and also to know how to use it and what to do with it and to protect others. And it was really, really a part of the issue of portraying the body of the combatant, both women and men. So I hope that I answered, you know, at least the part. So uh, I'm going to be the last one to ask a question. Um, so my question relates to something about sexual harassment. Um, the definition, there's no single definition or, you know, uh, counts of what can be described as sexual harassment. I'm not talking about physical assault. I'm talking about just harassment. In your interviews, how, how did you divide in what is harassment? and what is acceptable. Because the changing notion of harassment has kept on changing and it changes with traditions, families and everything. So how, how do you define, okay, we can slot this as harassment, this is what, and this is not harassment. Okay, so definitely we ask them about, in general, about harassments, if they experience this and if it's a yes or no, and then we gave them examples. If they have only one comment about, you know, the body and so on, it's a harassment for sure. If it's a repetitive, repetitive, uh, then it's like in a higher level. And then if there's actual threat, threat or something physical, then we move to the assault level. So in that sense, we ask them specifically about uh, the experiences they have and if they heard about harassment and sometimes we felt that they don't want to talk specifically about themselves so they said I didn't experience this but my friend in a different unit she told me that da 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 da, -da. or I heard that this and that happened to her and then we asked for the description since this is not uh, you know a quantitative research we just wanted to grasp the experience we assume that some of the stories happen to them, some of the stories happen to others, but we want to grasp the atmosphere of what they're facing with 
and also how they coped with it. Because it was very, very interesting to say, okay, so what did you do? Did you tell them to stop? Did you uh, inform your commander? Uh, did you do something else? And it was very, very interesting to see how they reacted to these environments. And I think when they were you know, more promoted in their roles, then they were more secure in just pushing everyone away. Just, you know, you're saying this to me, I'll put a bullet in your head. They're not going to put a bullet in their head, but that was the attitude of stay away from me. So, uh, and, and I think that in that sense, what I said before about those women going to civil life afterwards and they know the capabilities, I think they'll push not just sexual harassment, just also trying to make them smaller and make them feel, you know, not appreciative enough. So I think that will change the perception of women in society in general. Thank you. To end it all, thank you so much, Dr. Alet. It was seriously a terrific um, interaction. It was actually really, really amazing to hear you. Uh, with this, we conclude our today's session. Mm -hmm.